Okay, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another presentation of the online Cold Fusion Meetup. I'm Charlie Earhart, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And in this edition of the Meetup, our 278th being recorded on Thursday, December 10th, 2020 at noon U.S. Eastern, we've got Brad Wood on again. Thank you, Brad, for coming back. And he's going to talk about using Command Box CLI to manage all your servers, a topic that I find particularly appealing and look forward to. And... Um, let me say before I turn it over to him, if you look at the bottom of the screen there, um, if you want to tell people about the meetup, the URL is just coldfusionmeetup.com and the, all the sessions are recorded. This one will be available as soon as we're done. And they're also listed at recordings.coldfusionmeetup.com. All right, with that, Brad, take it away. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> How are we doing today? Uh, I put a note in the chat that um, I'll keep an eye there on the on the YouTube stream. So if you have any questions, um, you can just pound them into the chat, and I'll uh, I'll try to keep an eye on that as we go here. <clears throat> okay, so um, talking about command box today, and I'm going to focus on how to manage your servers. Um, I had, had mentioned to Charlie that command box has turned into. Uh, such a large surface area of features, it's difficult to even do a sort of introduction to everything Command Box does anymore, at least unless I want it to be like, you know, an all day talk. Um, so it works a little bit better just to kind of focus on one particular um, aspect of Command Box. And I think servers, uh, dealing with the servers are, is one of the most popular and useful <clears throat> features of Command Box. So there's a lot of stuff I won't even try to cover. And that's because I only have, um, I assume an hour. I didn't actually ask Charlie what time this is over, but I think it's an hour. I'm sure he told me, I just didn't listen. Sure, about an hour is fine. And okay. if you get towards the top of the hour and think you need to go long, just let us know. Perfect. Okay, um, I'm using a slide deck I've used before, but uh, it helps keep me on track. Otherwise, I, I tend to wander. Um, <clears throat> there's a, an analogy that's fairly old now, um, which uh, is the idea of the difference between tweeting, treating servers as pets versus cattle. Of course, I've had it pointed out to me that you could have a cow as a pet that granted. Um, the idea is that um, typically, and I definitely used to do this, um, you have a you have a set number of servers that it takes you, you know, days, maybe weeks to build out. You don't change that very often. Um, but a, a rancher managing, you know, hundreds of cattle might just, you know, buy and sell 20 of them at a time. And it's not like they, you know, have names. They don't, you know, care as much individually about them. And the goal with servers is to be able to make it easy to acquire or get rid of servers without a lot of overhead. It shouldn't take weeks to be able to spin up a new server. <clears throat> In order to do that, uh, according to the School of Redwood, um, your site needs to be uh, automated. Uh, well, the, the process of deploying a server or a site should be automated. <clears throat> it should be repeatable and it should be easy. Um, I think if you do the first two, you probably kind of get the, the second one a little bit automatic. Um, but it, it's definitely important to get rid of a lot of those manual steps that it takes to spin up a new server. And that's exactly the reason that I've had people bring to me when they say, I want to start using Command Box for my production servers, because um, I hate the fact that it takes me two weeks to reinstall everything I need to have a production server again if I need to you know, update my, my underlying uh, Windows version or something like that. So I've identified sort of three main uh, pillars of your server. Obviously, every app is, is a little special. Lots of people have, you know, additional external complications. But boiled down at its core, every cold fusion application you need to deploy uh, minimally has a, a, a CF version. Uh, it could be Adobe cold fusion. It could be Lucy. Um, in the past, it might have been Rilo. <clears throat> you have your cold fusion configuration. Uh, this is everything that goes in the administrator of your uh, cold fusion server. So your mapping, your data sources, request timeouts, session, um, caching, uh, those sort of settings. And of course you have your code, um, your CFML code that you're executing. And that could also include third-party libraries. It could include third-party jars. Uh, but these are sort of the three uh, legs of the tripod that, that hold up your application. And we're gonna talk about how Command Box um, helps cover each of these aspects of your server. So according to me, in my, uh, in my opinion, you shouldn't need to uh, download things, run installers, log into a web UI, which is a manual step a human has to take, um, run updaters to get the latest version, even though you just downloaded it off the website, 
uh, wonder if one server or PC is the same as all the other servers. I've definitely had that problem before. Um, or take days or weeks to provision a new server. Any of these sort of things are productivity killers. And if your boss comes into the office and says, our traffic is up, our site's you know starting to bog down over the load, how long will it take you to get three more servers online? If you're like, oh, geez, that's, that's going to take three weeks, right? That's, that's not a good thing. Um, and, and the items in this list are part of what make it take a long time to spin up a server. So with Command Box, we try to help with each of those um, items, making everything as, as quick and automatable as possible. So let's start with our first pillar, uh, which is the Cold Fusion engine and version. And of course, um, I should mention the, the server.json file as well. <clears throat> You'll notice that uh, as I go through this presentation, for those three pillars I, I had pointed out, the, the CF engine and version, the um, Cold Fusion configuration like data sources, and the code and libraries, there will be corresponding JSON files that Command Box works with that cover each of those. So to start out, um, you can start a server in Command Box uh, without having anything installed simply by running server start. Now, I'm kind of glossing over like a handful of things when I say that. Um, first of all, you have to actually have Command Box installed. So let's talk about that briefly, just in case you're not familiar with Command Box. Um, Command Box is a native binary, so it's like an EXE file on Windows um, that will run on Linux, that will run on Mac, it'll run on Windows, that will run on a Raspberry Pi. It'll honestly run anywhere that Java exists. If you can run Java, um, you can run uh, Command Box on it. <clears throat> Installing Command Box can depend on your, um, your operating system is what the easiest method is. For instance, if you're on a Mac, and you use Homebrew, which is a package manager, you can just type brew install command box and you're, you're done. You'll have command box installed. Uh, if you're on Windows and you use Chocolaty, which is a package manager, you can type Choco install command box. I rarely ever run across people that use Chocolaty. Um, if you're on Linux, we have apt and we have yum repos. Uh, the most traditional method to install command box is just to download the binary off of our site. So if we go to ordersolutions.com, and we click products and command box. If you type command box into Google, usually this will be the, the very first page that comes up. There's a big old fat download button here. It always has the latest version. 5.2 is the latest version. And you can just grab one of these links. So if you're on Windows, grab the Windows binary. If you're on um, Linux or Mac and uh, you just want to download the binary, you can click on this one. If you don't have Java installed on your computer, we also have versions of Command Box that include a JRE. It's the exact same uh, Command Box tool. It just it comes with a JRE folder um, that you, you keep in the same directory as the binary, and it'll be picked up and used. If your computer has Java installed on it uh, already, Command Box will, will simply pick that up and use it. <clears throat> so you don't need to run an installer for Command Box. You'll download a zip file. You can unzip the zip file. You can place the... Um, the executable file anywhere you'd like on, on your desktop, in a folder somewhere. Um, I recommend uh, putting it somewhere in your system path. So if you're on a Mac, it'd be like your user bin local or wherever, you know, that would be. Um, Windows sort of annoyingly doesn't really have a folder you can just drop stuff in other than like the system32 folder, which is messy. I don't like to put stuff in there. Um, so you'd need to edit some environment variables um, to have it available on your path. Uh, but basically, you just double click it to run it, or you can run it from the command line. Um, I wanted to cover that just because command line tools are something that a lot of Cold Fusion developers aren't comfortable with. I certainly wasn't super comfortable with command line tools. Um, I didn't really care for them because I thought they were a pain to use. Um, I always preferred a GUI. You know, that's why I like to manage an IIS server better than an Apache server or an Nginx server, just because. I can look at a GUI and I can click around and I can figure stuff out on my own. But when you look at something that requires a lot of command line or just editing you know, a text file to configure it, I never thought that was as intuitive. So we've worked hard to try to make Command Box be a CLI that doesn't suck in a lot of the ways that a lot of CLIs um, do sort of suck. So you know, if you're like me and every time you go to run a git command, you're like, oh crap, what was the name of the flag that I need? Right, and you have to go to Google and you have to, you know, search for the exact git command you needed, you know, or you'd like keep a doc of like common commands you can never remember. Um, and so the way we've addressed that uh, is, is a couple different manners. Um, 
there's two different ways before I show this, there's two different ways you can run, uh, run command box. And, uh, the first way is from your native shell. Now windows users don't tend to do a lot of stuff from a, from a, from a terminal. It's just not really in our nature to sit around with a terminal open all day long. It wasn't in my nature until I wrote command box. Um, Mac users, I'm more likely to see them with a bash terminal open and they're running commands in the bash terminal. Um, this is just a Windows command prompt. And I have the box binary on my particular computer uh, placed in the system path. So I can just run box anywhere and Windows will find that box.exe because it's in the, in the path. So the way to run command box just from your native shell, from your bash, and I do apologize, I can't easily increase the font size on these CMD windows. It's a limitation of the Windows 7 terminal. Uh, yes, this is a Windows 7 machine. So if I type box version, the box refers to the box.exe and the word version is the command I, I would like to run. So there's a version command then command box that outputs the version of command box. Um, give it a second to spin up here. It's a little slow on my machine with the screen share going. Uh, here's the output of the version command, right? Command box, and you'll see uh, I locally um, have the, the source code sim linked in, and so you see these placeholders where the version would normally appear. This is the first way you run, run command box from your native shell, and you proceed everything with the word box, just like you would with git or npm or, or pretty much any other command line tool. The second way that I'm gonna be using in all my demos today is if you just run box by itself or double click on box.exe, same difference. It'll open up in a in a CMD window. And yes, I do realize that's a grammatically incorrect way of using the phrase same difference. I started I started using the word same difference just to annoy one of my one of my friends who hated incorrect grammar. And now I just do it without thinking about it, even though it's not right. Um, if I just run box with no arguments, you see here it opens up a command box shell, and I can run the version command without the word box preceding it inside of here. And you see it's also much faster. So I recommend, especially if you're not used to using a terminal on your computer, opening up the uh, the shell that's built into command box automatically. This is where a lot of the helpful features are um, that make it a little bit nicer to use. And I'll look at the randomized quote of the day. You can start and stop servers from any directory. We should talk about that. So this second manner of running command box is the one I'll be showing. And I already have a command box shell open here. Um, this is a terminal called ConEMU that I like to use on older Windows machines, uh, largely because it supports 256 colors. It can increase the font size uh, significantly easier. If you're on Windows 10, the default terminal app now is much, much better than it used to be. You can maximize the window. You can uh, customize fonts more easily. You get 256 color support. Um, this is still a Windows 7 machine, so I had this uh, this Con EMU terminal. So uh, a couple things to show you if you're not familiar with command lines. Um, this little prompt that you see right here, it tells you the folder I'm in. It tells you information about the folder, the time of day. This is called Command Box Bullet Train, and it's a module that does not come installed by default. Um, you can go find Bullet Train on Forgebox, and you can install it. Uh, you will need to uh, configure a custom font to get these uh, cool little triangles here to show up. Uh, but the bullet train module makes um, it very uh, informational because it, it follows you around and whatever directory you're in, it outputs information about that directory. Uh, for instance, if I were to jump over to a folder that I know has a Git repo, um, you can see that additional information shows up now. This is the, the, the project I'm in. Here's the server in this directory. It stopped. It's on the master branch. There's two additions, 16 changes. There's all sorts of, of interesting information that, uh, that the, the bullet train prompt will show you. So the first thing is the help command. If you run um, help inside a command box, you'll get a list. Uh, and, and it looks even larger since my font size has increased here. Um, but a list of all the commands you can run and then a list of all the namespace, uh, uh, namespaces of commands. And command namespaces are just a command that has a common word at the start, a space, and then some additional word. So I can dig in and I can type server help, because server is um, a namespace of commands, which is listed right here. And this will show me all of the commands that start with servers. So server uh, start, server stop, server status, server show, right? These are all commands in the server namespace, as I call it. Um, you can drill down and get further help. We can say, okay, uh, show me about the, the server status uh, command. 
right? I can type help as well. Or another little trick is you can just use a question mark at the end of a line that's the same as the word help. Um, and here in an incredibly large font, I have um, the help for the server status command. So a description of what the command does, um, examples of how to call it. You can usually copy and paste these examples um, right out of here. And then a list of all the arguments that the server uh, status command accepts, name, directory, uh, verbose, JSON, right? So the help and command box is built in as a first class citizen. Um, and anytime you have questions about any command and command box, if you're not sure how to run it, just run the help command. Um, and one thing that sort of annoys me is, is different CLIs have different syntaxes. Uh, you know, sometimes it's dash dash help, sometimes it's slash question mark, right? And command box is always just the word help or a question mark. Actually, I think even slash question mark works. It does. Um, I, I implemented several ways to call help uh, just to, to ensure people could find it easily. So if you ever have a question about what a command does, you can always run the help by just slamming a question mark at the end of your command and running it and then reading through that to get some examples. <clears throat> the second thing command box does is tab completion. Now you do need, you can run the help command from anywhere, but you do need to be using command boxes, interactive shell that's built into it to get tab completion to work because your operating systems native shell doesn't know anything about command box. But when you're in command box a shell, it knows all about command box. So if I type server, uh, and first of all, you'll notice that the words turn yellow as I complete them. That means they're recognized. So if I type a non-existent command, you see how that SDF is white? That's because it's not recognized. But if I type a, a recognized command, you see how it turns yellow and bold? That's your first clue. So if you're typing a command and it's not turning yellow, you're probably typing it wrong. Check for, check for typos. Um, and then second of all, you can always hit tab. Always, always, always hit tab, no matter what you're typing. And command box will try really, really hard to guess what you want. So if I start with SER and I hit tab, it says, oh, you, you must mean server, right? I hit tab again and it says, okay, uh, here's all the possible things maybe you wanna type right now. Um, you can see they're broken into commands, namespaces. So I can keep hitting tab. Uh, the fact that groups just disappeared is a bug in JLine that'll be fixed in the next version. Um, I can use tab, shift tab, up arrow, down arrow. I can cycle through these and I can say, I want server, what was the one I was showing? Oh, info, right? Hit enter and it selects it. Now I can hit tab again, and it says <laughs> uh, it says there's a lot of options. The reason there's so many options is because I have like a hundred local servers I use for testing, and so it has hundreds of possible uh, things it wants to prompt me with. Um, I'm going to switch to a different command just for the sake of the tab completion not being as insane. So uh, I'll demonstrate tab completion on the Coalbox Crate App command. So if I hit tab again, it says, okay, here's all the parameters you can pass to this command. Which one do you want? And so I can say, okay, um, I want the wizard parameter. And I hit tab again and it says, okay, this is a Boolean parameter. Do you wanna pass in true or false? So command box will try really, 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 really hard to figure out every possible thing you might wanna type next based on all the context you've typed thus far. And if you ever have a question, just hit tab, right? And if that doesn't answer your question, add a question mark and run the help for the command. Um, I know I spent like five minutes on that, but I really wanted to drive home that we've tried incredibly hard to make command box not suck as a CLI for people that don't like CLIs, because I didn't like CLIs going into command box um, because they were hard to use. So familiarize yourself with the tab completion with the help stuff. Um, it'll really make your life a lot easier. Okay, so that should get you up to speed if uh, if you're not familiar just with command boxes of CLI. It's very easy to install. It's very easy to use. I see a couple questions here in the chat. Um, how do you get con MU to display between physics colors on Windows 10? Um, David, I don't know. If it doesn't do it, then you'll need to consult your documentation. But if you're on Windows 10, you don't necessarily need to use con MU because the default terminal will already do 256 colors. Uh, now, other things I like about Con EMU is you can hold down control and you can click on URLs and it'll open them automatically. You see how this underlined. Uh, you can highlight text and you can use control C to copy and you can use control V. In Con EMU, I can hold down shift and I can use my home and in keys to select text. There's a, there, there are things Con EMU does that you still can't do in the Windows terminal. But if you just want 256 colors and the ability to maximize the window and increase the font size, um, I would just use the the Windows terminal. But John, for our, to your point, there are still absolutely really nice features that Con EMU does that I'm not aware Windows terminal does yet. 
uh, such as the auto linking of URLs and, and the ability to control C, control V to paste and copy. Okay, so let's get back to where we were. Now that everybody is up to speed on downloading command box, installing it, working your way around the help commands, um, starting up a server in its most basic form is just server start. Um, and let me actually show that. So I am in a sandbox folder. I will uh, make a directory called online CF meetup. I will CD into that directory. You'll notice the command box has a lot of commands that are similar to bash or similar to DOS, right? This is the command box version of the make dear command, which is slightly different. It has a little flag you can supply that says after you make the directory, change into it. There's lots of little things like that built in the command box to make your life easier. Um, this is an empty directory. I'm just going to throw a, uh, a default Coldbox app template into this folder. Obviously, this entire talk has nothing to do with Coldbox. You can use these servers to start any application you would like, but it's just prettier when my browser opens up to see a, a welcome to Coldbox page or something. Um, there we go. So uh, that scaffolding command just dumped just a, a boring... Uh, cold box site into my web root. Start a server. I type, oop, nah. I just did what a lot of people do. I typed it backwards. I type start server. That will start a server named server. People do it all the time. It's server start. And the reason I realized I typed it backwards is because it didn't turn yellow. That's one of the reasons I had people send me screenshots when they say a command didn't work is because a lot of times they'll type it out of order without realizing it. And they'll tell me they type server start, but they actually type start server and then it doesn't work like they expect. Um, okay, so bullet train added a new car, right? Our server is starting, it's a Lucy server, it's version 537, and the current status is stopped, and that's because it hasn't quite came online. Um, it might be a little slow, the screen share is really hammering the, the poor CPUs on my machine, um, but it'll come on, it, it'll come open here in just a second. This is what it looks like when you screen share and start a server at the same time. Okay, well, that thing's hard. Um, we'll talk about what just happened. So without asking for any specific Cold Fusion engine, um, we got Lucy's server. And that is that is how Command Box works. Command Box is built in Cold Fusion. The actual CLI itself is written in Cold Fusion and it runs on an embedded version of Lucy. In fact, if you run the info command, in addition to the stereogram ASCII art, um, you can see that internally command box is running on Lucy uh, 537, which is why if you simply type start server, command box will just start up a server using the embedded version of Lucy it already has. It's nice and fast, it doesn't need to download anything. And here is our, our browser tab that popped open on another one of my windows. So we have a running site, which this is just that cold box template I tossed in the directory. Um, by default, we're on 127001, so localhost, and we're on a randomly chosen port. And this, in my case, 60,583, right? Uh, this is the default out of the box behavior. We can dial in a specific Cold Fusion engine, um, which includes any version of Adobe, all the way back to Adobe Cold Fusion 9 is as far back as I go. Uh, so every single update um, of Adobe Cold Fusion is on there. Oh, I see there's some more comments I've been missing. Copy and paste. Ooh, John's telling me Control C and Control V work now in Windows Terminal. Ah, that was not the case the last time I looked. I'm glad to hear they've added some of those features because um, I really enjoy doing that. Okay, well, I'll let the conversation keep going. Um, Oh, yes. Every every updater version of Cold Fusion is on there. So if you want Cold Fusion 2016, Updater 2, Updater 3, Updater 4, it's all available. And in addition, every single snapshot build of Lucy server can also be used. So like Bleeding Edge version of Lucy gets committed, the Travis build runs within 24 hours because it's a daily job. That snapshot will be up on ForgeBox and you can start it up locally and you can test the server with it. Um, there's also Lucy Light servers you can start, uh, which is Lucy without extensions. Um, and the way you dial those in is with this CF engine parameter. Now, if you're not familiar with ForgeBox, ForgeBox is um, sort of the, the package repository for the package management aspect of Command Box. It's for Cold Fusion developers. And even though it has the word box in the name, it is not specific to Cold Box or Test Box or any of the, the frameworks, right? 
Uh, Framework One is on here. Mira is on here. Preside CMS is on here. Uh, this is a generic tool by the Cold Fusion community. Um, so if we go look at CF engines, uh, we can see that there are projects on here for Lucy. Uh, there are, does it say how many versions? <laughs> There's 660 versions of Lucy. Um, on Forgebox, there are 63 versions of Adobe. They don't have nearly as many uh, snapshot builds. There's also the Lucy Lite version, 653 versions of those. Um, and if we were to uh, drill into this, this is actually a fun little feature I don't know if everybody knows about. You can, you can go to the versions tab, and you can see all 600-some-odd versions of Lucy that are on here. And you see there's just oodles of snapshot builds. There's on average about 70 to 100 snapshots for every Lucy release, and every single one of them is on here. What's cool is you can filter this uh, interface, and you can say, only show me stable builds. You can also do uh, searching based on the semantic version. So show me the 5.3.6 versions. Um, and now it filters our page down. And here we can see here are the two stable 5.3.6 versions of Lucy. Um, this is similar to the information you get when you oops, run the forge box show Lucy command. This is the same information we're looking at, um, except for this doesn't show you every single possible version just because it would be really ugly to try to uh, cram that in there. Um, so when you start um, a command box server using a different version of Adobe or Lucy, they're being pulled down from ForgeBox, right? This is where they come from. So if I stop my server, server stop, I got to type it right, it doesn't work. That's why I use tab completion because I can't type. <clears throat> I can run my start command again, server start. And this time I'll say CF engine equals Adobe. And guess what we get to do? Tab completion. So I hit tab. And um, there's so many options, it, it doesn't even display them nicely. Um, when you hit tab, Command Box will actually go out to Forge Box. It'll pull the list of all those versions that are available right then, and it'll present them to you as tab completion options. Uh, so if you're not sure what the exact version is, but you'd recognize it if you saw it, just hit tab. We will show you all the options. Um, by default, if I don't specify a version, I will get the latest stable version. So if you say CF Engine equals Adobe and that's all you type, you will get Adobe 2021, which will not even work with the Coldbox framework, unfortunately, right now. Um, if you type uh, CF Engine equals Lucy and you don't specify a version, you'll get Lucy 5.3.7, which is the current stable version of Lucy. So I can dial in, uh, let's say I want 2016, and you see as I'm typing, the list is filtering um, automatically. 2016.0 dot, uh, looks like update 16 is the latest update, right? So I can dial in uh, a very specific exact version of Adobe Cold Fusion. Um, I've already started an Adobe Cold Fusion 2016 update 16 server. So Command Box has already downloaded that artifact and cached it locally. This is why you don't see any, any download progress bars happening right now. Uh, Command Box will always use us local copies of things um, when downloading. Uh, while that murders my CPU, we'll, uh, we'll go back to the slides. <clears throat> so there's a lot of difference between the default server you get and all the ways you can customize uh, your server. The server I started before started on localhost. It started on some random huge port number. It started on Lucy server by default, but we can customize all of this. Um, in addition to customizing the Cold Fusion engine, whether it's Rilo or Lucy or Adobe or any particular version, uh, we can customize the heap size, the JVM args, the version of Java that we're using. In fact, if you're particularly observant, you may have noticed that one of the lines here says installing uh, Java OpenJDK 11. Um, that would be because I've configured my, my CLI to always run um, all my servers on Java 11. And so Command Box will reach out to the Adopt OpenJDK API, and it will download any version of, oop, here comes my, my Adobe site. It's really cranking slow with the screen share, I'll tell you what. Um, Command Box has an integration with the Adopt OpenJDK API, and it will automatically download new versions of Java 
um, without you needing to do anything other than saying, hey, give me the latest version of OpenJDK 11. So uh, when you type Java search, you can you can filter on all sorts of things. This is the latest Java 11 JRE 64-bit Windows hotspot JVM version of Java available, which is what my uh, computer is using. And it's actually worth noting that I'm running my CLI on Java 14. So my CLI is using Java 14, but I've set command box and asked it to start my servers on Java 11. Um, and so that's exactly what it does. Uh, we can control the ports that we bind to. You can, uh, by default, you get an HTTP uh, listener, which is uh, not using any, any SSL. Um, and by default, command box will just pick some random port that's not in use. We can tell what the port we'd like, port 8080, port 80. Um, we can tell what we want HTTPS. We can provide SSL search for it to use. We can even activate an AJP listener if we'd like to connect it to IIS or uh, some sort of AJP proxy. Um, command box also has a basic built-in web server that does a lot of what you use IIS or uh, Apache or Nginx for. I technically have IIS installed locally because this is a Windows machine, but I don't ever use IIS. I just hit command box directly. So you can configure virtual directories, um, all sorts of, uh, of features. I had to add the Luis Mahano, much, much more that has, as a requirement at the end of any bulleted list. Um, and these all go in your server.json file. The cool thing is when you start a server, and by the way, that command box, uh, oh, my Adobe site, uh, did go ahead and load here. So here's my Coalbox app running on Adobe ColdFusion 2016. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you the icons that also appear in my system tray that correspond with each server that I start because I'm sharing a different monitor. But if you're not familiar with command box servers, every time you start a server, you get a little icon in the system tray that uses the Adobe ColdFusion icon or the Lucy icon. And you can, you can click on these icons and there's options to open up the administrator, to stop the server, to open up the web route. There's all sorts of configuration there. Um, you just can't see it because uh, the screen share is on a different monitor. <clears throat> so I ran the server start command and I specified CF engine equals. If we were to look in my server.json file, and it's right here. Now, when I ran that cold box crate app command earlier, just to kind of dump this app template in, it came with a, uh, a server.json file that had a setting in it already. And if we look at the contents of this file, the server show, uh, that server.json file came with URL rewriting automatically enabled. When I ran that last server command, it updated my server.json to reflect the last settings I had used. So if you start a server and you say server start port equals 8080, it'll automatically get added into your server.json. So every subsequent server you start will always be on port 8080 or whatever that setting was you specified. There are oodles of settings you can put in here. Um, I don't have time to cover them, but they are every one of them in the documentation. I probably should have mentioned this earlier. The documentation for uh, command box can all be found at um, at commandbox.ordersbooks.com. Uh, while pasting that in the chat, I just noticed that Kevin asked, can it install Apache or IIS? Um, Commandbox will not install Apache or IIS. However, you don't technically need Apache nor IIS to use Commandbox, as I mentioned. It does have a built-in web server that supports probably 95% of what everybody uses Apache or IIS for. Um, you can even use it in production if you like. Um, it's very fast. I've done head-to-head -head performance tests with IIS versus Apache versus command box with J meter loads of, you know, thousands of requests per second to stir up static files. And it performs at the exact same levels of, uh, of throughput as Apache and IIS. Um, there's also, I, I wasn't even planning on covering it. The latest version of command box has a whole new suite of security um, settings that I worked with Pete Freitag even to help create. There's profiles that are uh, secure by default now. If you deploy a command box in production, it instantly locks down the cold fusion administrator. It blocks paths to all sort of sensitive files you might not want people to access. It turns off directory browsing. Uh, there's all sorts of secure by default um, and performance by default uh, settings that command box does. So you are under no requirement to need any other web server for the rest of your life. Command box is your one-stop shop. Now, 
if you would like to use Apache or IS or Nginx or whatever as a proxy in front of command box, you can absolutely do that. Uh, that is 100% supported. Uh, but I don't want you to be under the impression that you actually need it. Um, command box is a very full featured web server. It's built on top of JBoss Undertow, uh, which is what powers JBoss Wildfly. It's a Red Hat product. Uh, that's what command box bundles as the underlying servlet container. So uh, docs, commandbox.orderbooks.com. Everything I'm covering today is all documented in the embedded server section, mostly under the configuring your server section. Um, if you dig through here, uh, if you read everything in the section, you'll basically know about everything there is to know about command box servers. And one of these pages in here shows uh, a server.json file with every possible setting in it. Uh, now, hopefully your servers aren't this complex, but this is clearly for the sake of example. Um, there are a tremendous amount of configuration items you can stick into the server.json. So your server.json file is usually something you commit to the source code repository. When a new developer comes online, they do a git pull or a git clone, they get that server.json file along with your cold fusion code and all they need to run is server start. And it'll it'll snag all those settings from the server.json file. It'll use them and it'll start up the server with the version of Adobe you need, the JVM arguments you need, the version of Java you need, the virtual directories you need, the custom error pages you need, whatever your settings are, Every one of your developers type server start, they get the exact same server, even if they're on a Mac and you're on Windows, doesn't matter, right? Okay. So that's our server.json file. Speaking of IIS, um, if you like, if you're tied to IIS, maybe for other reasons, maybe you're using some IIS modules, you really prefer IIS, that's fine. Uh, there is a screencast out there that shows how to use the bond code connector with IIS, it's, it's, it's quite easy. Um, you can, um, sorry, reading some chat comments here. Um, you can activate the AJP listener. You can install bond code. You can proxy request through. Uh, I was just helping someone with this this week. Uh, you can reach out if you need additional help with that. Also, um, for production use, most people set up their servers as a service. Um, you can use the Windows service uh, in SSM, which stands for the non-sucking service manager. This works well. It takes a little bit of manual configuration. If you want an easier solution, um, there is the command box server service manager. <laughs> service command box service manager. I always trip over my over my tongue. Um, this is a commercial module, meaning we charge you like fifty bucks to use it. So I won't really turn this into a commercial. This will create Windows services, Linux services, and Mac services for you. Uh, if you're curious about it, you can go read all about it. But I won't. I won't spend any more time on that since that's a, a paid thing. If you want to do it for free, you can just use the NSSM, the non-sucking service manager. Okay, <clears throat> that's our first pillar. That was a big one. Let's talk about the two remaining ones, which are get a little bit easier. Uh, we can start our server. We can dial in all the settings for the JVM, how Java's configured, the, the Adobe engine, the Lucy engine. We have all that stuff, the ports in our server.json uh, file. Now let's talk about cfconfig. Um, CF config does not come out of the box with a command box. I don't know. At some point I made to start bundling it. It started as sort of a separate project that's grown into one of the foundational pieces of command box. Now, if you use command box inside of the Ortis solutions, command box, Docker image, you will automatically get CF config. It's so darn useful. We just install it for you automatically there. Um, CF config can be found, uh, as all things can on ForgeBox. So if we search uh, ForgeBox for cfconfig, um, you want the cfconfig CLI. Um, this has its own docs located at cfconfig.ordisbooks.com. As a general rule, if you type the name of an Ordis product, .ordisbooks.com, that will be the documentation site for that product. It works cold box, test box, content box, command box, cfconfig. It's just .ordisbooks.com. Um, CF config will be something you need to install and you can install it very easy by typing install command box hyphen CF config. And remember that tab completion I keep harping on? Tab completion even works on installation slugs. So I type C-O-M-M-A-N-D and I hit tab and it populated out command box and it shows me everything 
that starts a command box. When you hit tab, command box actually makes an HTTP request out to the forge box JSON REST API and says, what are all the packages you have that start with the word command? And this is a live view of everything published on forge box right now. Uh, so always, always, always use tab completion because otherwise, if you're like me, you'll probably type it wrong. Um, so install command box CF config. That will install CF config in your CLI. I already have it installed. And it will add a new namespace of commands called CF config, which of course we can get help on. CF config import, export, diff, transfer, right? And then a whole bunch of nested namespaces. So CF config is, oh, is a module <clears throat> for command box. It adds additional functionality onto command box. And um, it allows you to manage everything that is inside of the Cold Fusion administrator. So that uh, Cold Box site that I started up in Adobe Cold Fusion 2016, I'm using the tray icon as a shortcut to open my administrator. Sorry, I'm trying to think, what is my default password? I changed it so many times. <laughs> One moment. I've forgotten what my default password is. I changed it the other day so it wouldn't show up when I was doing a screencast. Um, and then I've actually forgotten what I set it to. Um, I actually, I'll show you guys um, how I set it. Sorry, I'm in a different monitor right now, just in case it's something that I don't want you to see. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to, oh, here it is. Box.env. Oh, no, it is the word password. Oh, my caps lock key was on. I think that was the problem. Okay, it really just was the word password. I just had my caps lock on. Nothing to see here. Um, I'll show you uh, the default password that you will get for any uh, Adobe server with command box is actually the word command box, all lowercase. Um, however, I have a couple things in place here. Um, I have the command box.env module installed, uh, which is another uh, third party module that's very handy. Um, it allows you to automatically read environment variables out of a .env file that exists in your directory. In fact, if you look, um, in, in my little cold box sample app, it actually comes with a .env file, uh, which if we cat it out, you see, it just has some examples, you know, environment, database connection details, right? The .env file allows me to, uh, reference these, um, oops, I can't type, allows me to reference these environment variables and on the fly, it reads them out of that .env file. So I can use the env show command. I can even do things like the system setting um, expansion placeholders, which I'm having troubles typing, uh, db database, right? Same thing. That's what the .env module helps me do. And it's super handy with servers because all of these environment variables are loaded up and passed to the server as JVM properties and environment variables you can actually access inside of your application. But there's a nice little trick here. In my, uh, this is my user home directory in Windows. I have a .box.env file in my user home, which is a global environment file. This applies to all command box instances as soon as you start them up. And it, inside of this file, I have this line right here, cfconfig underscore admin password equals password. This little bit of magic will create in conjunction with the .env module, an environment variable that just always exists in my command line called cfconfig underscore admin password with the value of password. One of the many features the cfconfig module has is every time you start a server, it will look through all the environment variables it can find and any environment variable that starts with cfconfig underscore it will look at that, it'll take whatever this name is and it'll set that setting on your server as it's starting. So what this does is every time I start a local server, whether it's Lucy or Adobe or even Rilo for that matter, it automatically overrides the administrator password to be the word password. Uh, that way, whenever I start local servers, I always know what the administrator login is, it's always just password. Um, however, your caps lock key does need to be off if you intend to log in. <laughs> um, okay. so back to where I was going before I got sidetracked on that password. Um, here's the Adobe Cold Fusion administrator for that cold box app that I'm running right now. Everything inside of this is managed by our CF config uh, utility. I just talked about how I manage the password for it. Um, in here, we have things like cold fusion mappings. We have things like our data sources. In fact, I think there might be a default data source. Yeah, there's an out of the box data source 
called Colbox. I don't think it does anything, but it, it just came out of the box with my application template. Uh, now you may notice I, I never created this data source, right? This is a fresh Adobe 2016 server. I just started about five minutes ago. You never saw me manually create this data source, right? Yet there's a data source called Colbox with some default settings. Where did this come from? This came via CF config, right? All right, let me double check. I see some questions flying through here. Um, blah, blah, blah. What is the help area? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, looks like stuff's being handled over there. <clears throat> uh, so CF config manages data sources, caches, mappings, debugging settings, lockdown, scheduled tasks, only in Adobe, mail servers, right? All of these things are managed by CF config. How? Um, I mentioned that it added a whole namespace of commands. CF config help, right? So <clears throat> if I type something like CF config show, using tab completion here, uh, it'll dump a JSON representation of all the settings of my server out. And this is that Adobe Cold Fusion 2016 server that I started. Uh, here's that data source that we saw called Colbox. Here's all the settings for the data source, right? CF config, uh, can, it, it goes and it reads all the XML files that Adobe or, or Lucy stores these settings in on the fly. It slurps all that data out and then normalizes it into the sort of generic JSON format. In fact, here's uh, the hashed version of my password, password, right? Um, we can import and export settings. So if I say uh, cfconfig export and I want to put it into a file called settings.json, that output a new file called settings.json, which is the exact same JSON that we just looked at above when I type cfconfig show. I can also type cfconfig import settings.json, and that'll turn it around, and that'll take all the settings in the JSON file. It'll import it into my Cold Fusion server or whatever the default server is running in this directory, right? Um, this is really, really huge, and it's very handy. And Charlie just mentioned this in the chat. I'm showing the CF config utility in the context of command box servers. If you're thinking to yourself, I'm not gonna use command box on production, it's just not part of our workflow, but man, I wish I could use CF config to manage my production server settings. Guess what, you can. CF config can be used for any Cold Fusion server, regardless of how it's installed. That means a traditionally installed Adobe on Tomcat server, a traditionally installed Lucy on Tomcat server, any of those, even Adobe Cold Fusion deployed as a war on, on Glassfish. It doesn't matter. Um, you can point CF config at the directory where the server lives, and it will read and write those XML files um, and import and export out of the JSON for you. Um, I'm just demonstrating CF config, however, in the context of command box servers, in which case I don't need to tell it where the server lives because, well, it's running inside a command box. It can find the data on its own. Um, so by default, let me delete this settings file since I don't need it. Uh, another file that came with our Coldbox app template, which is another reason why I like using a Coldbox app template, because we have all of this good stuff just dropped in there for you. Um, by default, command box uses a file called .cfconfig.json. Uh, you'll see a lot of these files that start with a dot. That's sort of the, the Unix uh, wink and a nod that says, hey, this is a hidden file. And a lot of web servers, including command box, will refuse to serve up uh, files that start with a dot uh, via the browser. And that's just for security. Um, I pointed out that cold box data source earlier. Where did that come from? Well, that came from our .cfconfig.json file, right? Data sources, uh, the name of the data source was a variable called DB database, which is actually the same environment variable I was dumping out earlier. And here's the configuration for that data source, which you can see a lot of placeholders in here, host, driver, database. So what happened is when I started this server, this Adobe Cold Fusion server I have running, the CF config module by convention looked in the web root and said, oh, hey, there's a file here called .cfconfig.json. That's the magic file name I look for. I'm going to read this JSON file and automatically import all of its settings into whatever server I'm starting, which in our case is our Adobe Cold Fusion 2016 server. That's how our server automatically gained that cold box data source without me having to do any work. That means that when your new coworker does a git clone in your site 
and you have a server.json file and you have a .cfconfig.json file, all they have to do is type server start. And not only do they get all the JVM args and the engine details, they also get all the data sources, all the mappings, all the confusion settings automatically without having to lift a finger. As long as you put the right file names with the right convention and the right folders, it all just works. So you'll see there's sort of a marriage of like several configuration files all happening because all these placeholders, DB database, DB host, DB driver, DB database, right? Where are those coming from? If I type in the show, you can see that I have a whole bunch of environment variables to find. This one came from our global .env file that I showed you earlier. The rest of these all came from this .env file that was sitting here in my web root, right? So all of our products that we use at Ortis, uh, all of our projects rather, by default, out of the box, we have .env installed, we have cfconfig installed, um, and all these things sort of work um, in synchronous. Yes, Kevin, it will work on Rilo. Fun fact, uh, the Rilo and Lucy configuration files are nearly identical. In fact, you can actually drop a Rilo configuration file into Lucy and it'll read it and convert it to a Lucy file. Okay, <clears throat> so lots of interworking pieces, but when you put them all in place, it sort of just works and it's really nice. So cfconfig is scriptable. This is huge. Um, a lot of, I've, I've worked with a lot of clients that work for like government and they have these, these huge lockdown guides they have to follow, right? And they're always manual. It's just this giant spreadsheet and some poor sucker has to sit there with a spreadsheet open on one monitor and they log into the Cold Fusion Administrator and it's like, click, 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 highlight the row, click, right? You don't want to do that. It takes forever. It's not consistent. Uh, it's prone to errors. You can import all of those settings in your government or your corporate lockdown in about 0.1 second with cfconfig and a JSON file, you would declare these are all of our lockdown settings, cfconfig import, done, right? Works the same every time. Scriptable is huge. You can automate it. Um, and you also get tab completion. Yes, Jim Priest, STIGS, the good standard technical implementation guide, I think that stands for. So the tab complete is great, right? cfconfig, I hit tab and it says, oh, here's your options. I hit oh, tab again, I get, uh, completion on all of these. If I hit tab again, it says there's 229 settings. Which one do you want? Let me start typing. Uh, I'll start typing the word request. And it says, okay, here's all the settings that I know of that start with the word request. All right, what is the request timeout setting on my server? Okay, it's 300 seconds. That's the timestamp, days, minutes, hours, seconds, right? Tab completion is your friend. Hit tab and command box will work really hard to figure out what the heck you want. Um, I didn't uh, mention it, but I can also set individual settings uh, using the same format uh, of a timestamp, days, minutes, no, days, hours, minutes, seconds. Um, I will set the request timeout to be 60 seconds for the server. Now, I would need to restart this Cold Fusion server to pick up that setting because my config set command edited the XML files on disk. But since my server is already running, um, I would need to restart the server to pick up those new settings. Just a little side note on that. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to show every CF config command. Um, import, export, uh, transfer will move settings from one server to another. Super handy. What's nice about CF config is you can transfer settings from an Adobe server to a Lucy server or vice versa. The JSON format is agnostic. It's generic, right? So when it pulls the settings out of the Adobe server, it massages them into the generic format. And when it pushes them into the Lucy server, it re-massages them into the Lucy specific format. So if you manage different versions of Adobe, different versions of Lucy, all in, in unison, a single JSON file will manage all of those settings at the same time. Diff is also insanely handy. Um, I can say, oops. Uh, CF config diff, and I believe the first two settings are to and from. Yeah. So uh, diff from, I have a server called CF config. I'm using tab completion like the wind here. I will diff that to my CF config Adobe 11 server. I have test servers out the wazoo, right? This will compare all the settings between those two servers, and it will show me every setting that's the same in green, every setting that's in both servers, but different in red, and every setting that exists in one server, but not the other in yellow. Um, this is incredibly deep, and there's actually a verbose mode you can activate that will break out 
like data sources into all the individual settings. So like this one checkbox and one data source is different between these two servers. Um, and you can also take these diffs and you can export them into PDFs and into HTML, which there's government um, clients of mine using nightly scheduled tasks. Uh, then these are not command box servers, right? Mind you, these are just Windows VMs with a traditional Adobe ColdFusion installation. But they have a nightly scheduled task that spins up command box off of like a freaking USB drive. So they technically don't have to worry about all the lockdown requirements of what they've installed and what they haven't installed. Um, they run a, a nightly diff of every production server against a gold standard JSON file export those diffs into a shared drive as a PDF, and they can go back and they can audit their settings and say on this date, this setting was guaranteed to have been this as compared to our gold standard JSON file. And they do it all with CFconfig and they're not even command box servers. Okay. So uh, CFconfigs in JSON, everything's portable, generic across the CF engines. You can have more than one JSON file if you want. The 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 convention of the .cfconfig file um, is great, but you can have as many JSON files as you want. You can manually import them. There's really no limit. Uh, we got the auto import on server start and you can commit them to your repository and share them with your team. I highly recommend you um, dig into these uh, environment variable replacements because things like passwords I don't recommend you putting them into a JSON file and committing them to your source code repository and pushing them out to Bitbucket or whatever. Even if, you're, if your source code is private, uh, this is just bad practice. Um, these environment variable placeholders are what allow you to extract that sensitive information or just maybe information that's different per environment or different per user out into something like .env, which you don't commit to your source control, or maybe you supply that via your Docker orchestration mechanism. Right, um, big will show you uh, your passwords. If I say uh, CF config, actually, I think I can just do data source list. Um, no, I don't show the password in this list in this screen. That's fine. Uh, I'll do CF config show uh, data sources. Uh, do I have a password? It might be empty. I'm not sure. Oh, it is empty right now. Um, this is a bad example because I don't actually have a password. If you have a, an actual password set, which I'm sure you do, your plain text password will show up right here, like the unencrypted please hack me password. So be careful with your .cf config files because out of the box, they are just as important slash sensitive as your actual XML files on your hard drive that store your configuration, right? Um, your password, your mail server passwords, all of that can be accessed. So just keep that in mind, use those environment variable placeholders um, so you don't have to worry about any security concerns. Okay, last one's the easiest. Uh, this was the third pillar, which is your code, CFML of course, because why would you write apps and anything else? Um, your code, you want it to be self-contained. Hopefully you're using a, a, a framework like Coldbox or Framework One that has environment detection, am I in development, am I on staging, am I in production? Uh, you don't 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 want to have a deployment process where you move code to the production server and you have to go in and you have to edit files and change things to be the production settings. Please don't do that. I still see clients that do stuff like that. Don't 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 externalize all those settings into things like environment variables. Environment variables are the standard for cloud deployments today, and Command Box has everything you need to work with them. Uh, use cold fusion mappings for portability. Do not have code all over your application that says D colon slash websites slash, right? Don't do that. Because when the guy joins your team and he uses a Macintosh computer, your code isn't going to run on his app. Use cold fusion mappings so you only have a couple places that can be dynamically configured um, for all that. And of course, use source control, right? All of these things help your code uh, be portable. So I mentioned there's a JSON file for each of our three pillars. Our third pillar was your code. And guess what? That's your box.json file. This allows you to define all of your third-party frameworks and libraries. And if we go look at our little cold box application that I'm using as a sample, we'll see there's a box.json file. And it has a handful of things. It has a dependency of cold box, uh, whatever the latest version of 6 is. And it also has some development dependencies, which we wouldn't deploy on production, but we would use for local development. So uh, test box is the development dependency, um, the command box.env module, the command box.cfconfig module, 
even the command box CF format module. Here's a module I didn't write. Um, well, I didn't write .env either, but an Ordis employee did. CF format's a fantastic module that will automatically format your code even as you type via a watcher. Super cool, check it out. Um, so my box.json file declares all these dependencies. And even though uh, it sort of happened automatically, you probably didn't realize it was happening. When I ran that cold box create app command that sort of just dumped this application in, what it did behind the scenes is it ran an install command. And when you run install, command box looks at your box.json and it says, okay, what are all the dependencies this application requires? Let me go out to ForgeBox, download them all, install them all. Now your application is ready to run. So again, these don't have to be cold box specific, right? Preside CMS, Mira, Framework One, all of these separate non-Ordis frameworks use ForgeBox and they put their third, they put their dependencies on ForgeBox, right? You can specify jar files even in your box.json. You can even specify Lucy extensions in your box.json that you want installed into Lucy. And when you run the install command, we'll go, we'll get that Lex file, we'll download it, we'll install it into Lucy for you. So this is the JSON file that sort of controls that third tier. Um, you don't commit these dependencies to source control, right? You just describe what they are. And when you go to deploy your code, you use command boxes package management to say, go get all my third party dependencies and stick them in. Use semantic versioning or Simver as we call it to decide what version you want. For instance, I want the latest version of Coldbox 5, but I'm not ready for Coldbox 6, right? You can specify that. Um, and then you just run that box install to build out your code. Okay, those are our three tiers, and I'm pretty much at the hour, so let's uh, breeze through these last few slides. I mentioned environment variables. Um, I definitely recommend you look at these. If you're moving toward any kind of cloud deployment, anything with Docker, um, environment variables is where it's all at. It's not something I was ever used to messing with prior to getting into cloud deployments, um, but the .env module and those .env files will get your, your code base in a point to where when you want to push it into a Docker container and deploy it out on Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, IBM, Google Cloud Platform, any of those, they're all going to expect you to have environment variables. Uh, and that's how you keep those passwords out of the config files, You know, keep those mail servers to where you can dynamically change it between uh, staging and production. Um, okay. Any JSON file that command box reads can use these placeholders. I showed them to you in the CF config JSON, but as a general rule, anytime command box reads a JSON file, whether it's the server JSON, the CF config JSON, the box JSON, it will automatically look for this dollar sign curly bracket uh, placeholder. It'll expand those in place to be whatever the value of the environment variable is, or you can have a colon and a default value. Um, and it's very convenient. If you're using Lucy Server 5 or Adobe ColdFusion like 2018 and up, I believe, they automatically have environment variables in the server scope, uh, system property and environment variables both, uh, which is very handy. Uh, if you're using Coldbox 5 and up, there's a git setting or a git system setting function in the, in the Coldbox uh, config CFC that will also automatically read environment variables. Um, or if you're on an older version of Lucy or Adobe, there's some very simple uh, code you can use to access them as well. Um, so a lot of different libraries have a lot of different helpers out there um, to make it uh, useful. Uh, David asks in the chat, is there a way to use ENV files if you're using IIS as the web server? Uh, yeah, I mean, IIS is sort of an orthogonal concern. Whether or not you're using a, a given web server really has no bearing. Um, now, if you're asking if there's a way to use ENV files if you're not using command box, perhaps you have a traditionally installed Adobe ColdFusion server. Um, there are ways, but it, it gets a bit more manual. It's not as nice. Uh, there is a Coldbox module out there that will read a .env file in as Coldbox settings. Uh, I've also seen people that just write their own helper functions that will just parse the properties file and load up the settings. Um, there's always ways to do it. It just, it just, it moves from the world of just works out of the box, easy peasy to, okay, now you have to write some code to make it work. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Production service, not using command box. So here's the thing. The .env file was originally meant to be a development helper tool. The thought being that on production, you would actually be using like real live actual environment variables 
um, on your on your production server. Um, now, if you just have a traditional Windows VM with with Cold Fusion installed, you're probably not used to. It's probably not part of your normal workflow to set environment variables. That's something that you really get into in like the Docker space and the cloud deployments. Um, so, like I said, I mean, the idea was in production that you would use like actual environment variables in the actual you know operating system, and the .env file was like a shim to mimic that in, in development. Um, but there's nothing preventing you from writing some custom code that, you know, reads uh, the DNV file yourself and, and, you know, appends JVM properties or, you know, something like that. There's a lot of ways to solve it. Um, and there, there we go. Uh, Charlie has some links about some easy ways to, uh, to access those as well. Okay, I've mentioned the .env module like 15 times now. Look into it. That, that doesn't come by default, but I highly recommend it. Um, you don't commit that .env file to source control, right? That is super secret and it has all your passwords and things in it. You may notice that this Coldbox sample app that I've been playing with has a .env file and a .env.example. This is the convention we use. All of our repositories have a have an example uh, .env file that's empty. And so a new developer takes that example file and they're like, okay, these are all the environment variables I need to find then they actually put those values in their real .env file. And you'll notice that our default get ignore file that we ship with this cold box template ignores that .env file. We don't commit it to source control. We only want me to put in source control is the example file, which is free of your actual secrets. All right, that's that's our, our basic workflow for making sure we keep those. Uh, Daniel, the .env file is only stored locally. It only exists on local developer machines. It, it never goes anywhere, right? Uh, at least that's that's the typical workflow of it. It's just a local shim that you never commit where you put your personal passwords or settings that only apply to a local version of your code. Um, you know, for our Docker Swarm deployments at Ortis, when we deploy to stage of production, we have actual first-class environment variables to, declared on our Docker Compose files that have the actual production values. Or we use Docker secrets. There's all sorts of vaults and, and, and different cloud providers have their own uh, mechanisms for that. Okay. So to kind of put a bow on this so we can get done, um, our happy place is when we can wrap up an entire web server, all the config, all of our source code, um, and just a few JSON files, and we can fully describe everything about um, a server. Um, a couple honorable mentions. If you use Fusion Reactor and you want to run your servers on Command Box, guess what? There's a module for that. Um, install Command Box Fusion Reactor. You obviously do need to purchase a Fusion Reactor license. I highly recommend their developer license. It's about $199 a year, and you can use it on all of your Command Box servers that you run locally, non-production. Uh, it's incredibly easy. Just install this module and register your license key, and you're done. Every Command Box server you start will automatically have Fusion Reactor installed. In fact, here I can show you. Um, you can't see it, but when I right-click on my tray icon, I have a little open Fusion Reactor menu item that's been dynamically added in based on my Fusion Reactor module. And this is the local Fusion Reactor instance, um, which I have running on that Adobe Cold Fusion 2016 server I started. This is running my uh, developer edition of Fusion Reactor, and every local website that I run on Command Box automatically has Fusion Reactor, and this, I love this. I use this for everything. Of course, uh, it works just as well in your production deployments as well, naturally. Um, host updater module is something you would only use for local development, but this is very handy because if your, uh, if your site needs a special domain name to be able to work correctly, like, you know, www.dev.mysite.com or mysite.local or whatever, the host updater module, every time you start your server, if you've configured a custom host name in your server.json, it will automatically edit your computer's host file on the fly, and it'll add a host entry with whatever that little custom uh, local host name is that points to localhost. Uh, that way, you can even run all your local sites on port 80 if you like, because it uses a different 127 uh, localhost IP every time. Super handy for local development. It really helps you clean stuff up so everything isn't just on 127.0.0.1. You can actually have, you know, my local site.dev or something like that. Uh, host updater module just saves you the trouble of manually uh, manually editing your host file uh, to keep that stuff in there. Super handy. So you just hired a new employee or you're 
your boss said we need to deploy a new server and in, in production, right? This is what it takes to spin up a server now. Git clone, whatever your server is, box install, pulls in all the dependencies, box server start. Boom. The next thing you see is a web browser opening up. You have a running server with all of your code, all of your dependencies, dependencies, all of your JVM arguments and Adobe Cold Fusion versions and Java versions, and all of your Adobe Cold Fusion or Lucy server settings, data sources, CF mappings, all in those three commands. And those should take you less than 60 seconds to run, right? Unless, you know, your repo takes a while to clone. But this is where we are. And this is where we want to be, right? It's automatable. It's repeatable. It doesn't matter what your operating system is, Mac, Linux, Windows. This is what allows you to um, not dread the task of spinning up a new server. Because I've done like the local development machines with a team of about 10 developers and we had to manually install Cold Fusion and it sucked, right? I wish I had Command Box, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I was doing that. <laughs> All right, so I'm not really going to talk about Docker other than saying that um, Docker is really popular right now, and it's sort of the epitome of give me 10 servers, click a button, boom. You just added 10 servers in, right? We use Docker Swarm at Ortis. We absolutely love it. It's like Kubernetes, but a thousand times easier. Uh, but don't get me wrong, Docker is already like, there's a huge learning curve with Docker, right? So don't think you're going to pick up Docker in a weekend. I still kind of hate Docker and I have to Google it constantly to remember how to run all the CLIs, but we do love Docker and there is a command box based Docker image that takes everything I just talked about for the last hour and drops it inside of a Docker container. So all of our Ortis websites like forgebox.io are hosted on production on Docker Swarm running Docker images powered by command box that use server.json, cfconfig.json, and box.json to fully automate the build out of those Docker images. Um, and we use Docker for local development, so we have the exact same consistent command box based environment on my local Windows machine as I do on my production Linux machine. Um, the exact same settings, the exact same versions, the exact same configuration. Um, it's very nice and uh, it's a very easy way to get into it. There are official Adobe Cold Fusion images provided by Adobe. There are quote unquote official Lucy images. In my incredibly biased opinion, none of them are as polished and as easy to use as the Ortis command box based image. And if for no other reason, just CF config. Right off the bat, you will only find CF config in the Ortis image. And that, in my opinion, is worth the, the cost of admission right there. Just being able to drop a JSON file and boom, you know, all your stuff's configured. So anyway, uh, check those out if you want to mess with them. Spinning up local uh, command box based Docker image is as simple as this, unless you hate CLIs, in which this might look rather confusing. Um, but I'm then going to try to breach the topic of Docker because that's like an entire, you know, like eight hour course all on its own. So uh, that's it. That's it with the slides. Obviously, I sort of just kind of skipped across the surface. I mean, everything I mentioned today has just oodles of configurational settings um, inside of it. But my my hope is that um, instead of trying to cover it all, I could whet your appetite. And uh, you can come over here to commandbox.ordisbucks.com and you can click on the embedded server section and just read through this. And this goes into all sorts of detail on everything I covered today um, and more. So are there any other questions in the chat? I know there's been a, a fair amount of uh, a chatter. It looked like most things were being um, talked about. Uh, David, you guys, I saw you guys were talking about automatically creating um, SSL search with Let's Encrypt. There's been a handful of conversations uh, that have happened on Slack um, with some people talking about, you know, would it be possible to write a module for Command Box that either added some some commands or added some on server start behaviors that could go out, hit the Let's Encrypt API, could auto create SSL certs on the fly. Um, the short answer to that is yes, that could absolutely be written and I'm waiting for someone to write it. I just don't care enough to write it myself and I'm really busy. Um, there's there's all sorts of untapped potential of things you could do to automate the, the SSL cert process. Um, command box can be extended by modules of your own design. They can listen to interception points like on server start, on server stop. Things like the host updater module do exactly that, right? They listen to these announcements and they go off and they do things. 
Uh, so there's all sorts of potential there. Um, just nobody's done it. That's that's the thing. Nobody's just sat down and said, I'm going to write this. Um, and to be honest, I'm just too busy and I don't care enough. So I'm probably not going to mess with it. But I would love to help someone who wanted to take a stab at, at automating the creation of, of SSL search or something like that with the, the Let's Encrypt API. Uh, yeah, and Daniel uh, also has a note uh, about picking up cold fusion hot fixes and updates. When you use command box to, to run your servers, you don't ever update cold fusion or Lucy again. That doesn't exist. There's no such thing as an Adobe cold fusion updater, right? Boom, gone. Forget about it. All you do is you ask command box for the version you want and command box gives it to you. And since your entire server can be recreated from scratch in seconds, server stop, server forget, it's gone, server start, boom, now it's back, right? Then you, you don't you don't care about updating an existing installation of Adobe Cold Fusion. When you want the new updater version, you just update your JSON file and say, okay, now give me updater 10. Restart the server, boom, you're on update 10. Oh crap, I don't like it, it broke everything. All right, edit the JSON file to say, never mind, put me back to update nine, restart the server, you're now back on update nine. You don't you don't update installations of Lucy or Adobe Cold Fusion in place any longer. Just tell Command Box the version you want; it'll get it for you. And if you just say, "Give me Adobe Cold Fusion 2018, whatever the latest updater is," when Adobe releases an update, we put it on Forge Box. The next day, you restart your server. Boom! You just get it automatically. Now, I wouldn't recommend that on production, mind you, but for local development, it's great. Just restart the server. Oh, look, a new update just downloaded. Okay, I'm on the latest version of Adobe Cold Fusion. You don't even have to lift a finger. You never have to manually install an update again. So uh, thanks for pointing that out, Daniel. Uh, Rob says, what about CF version migration? Are the config files similar? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking about, but generally speaking, the config files are identical across all versions of Cold Fusion. Uh, CF config will import its CF config JSON files into any version of Cold Fusion, Lucy. The config files are fully CF engine agnostic. They don't care what CF engine they go into. And every time a new version of Cold Fusion comes out, um, I update CF config to to know how to read and write that version of XML files. So yeah, um, the migration should be very easy there. Okay. So Brad, uh, the outstanding question is John's. You can see it there at 12, 13 central time. I, I see John mentioned ARM, though I'm not sure what the question is. You can already run command block on a Raspberry Pi, which uses an ARM chip. Um, that, that works right now. So I, I don't know what the actual question is. You mean you're reading what he says at 1213? Uh, what about ARM? What about it? Like I said, if you can run Java, you can run command box. And there is an ARM version of Java. You want to see command box running on an ARM processor? I'll show you right now. Hi.bradwood.com. This is a content box site running on command box on a Raspberry Pi over to my left on my desk, and it's running on an ARM processor using the ARM version of Oracle Java. You can you can hit it right now. In fact, I can I can look and see if the number of requests per second spikes all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have an issue running command box on an ARM processor, let me know what it is. But other than that, assume that it works, and you just need to go off and do it. I notice he refers to Docker desktop. So if me have been referring to your Docker images, any issue with the Docker images running on ARM? None that I'm aware of. Like I said, try it and tell me if you run into issues. Um, I mean, command box Angel runs on a JVM. As long as you can put a JVM on it, you should be able to run command box. So assume it'll work. And if it doesn't, let me know and we can look into it. But it's if it didn't work, it would probably be a problem with the JVM itself. So, John, when you say detailed how-to instructions, can you... We're waiting for you to write those, John. Are you talking about command box or the Docker images or what? I assume he's asking for detailed how-to instructions to run it. And like I said, we're waiting for you to write those, John. Those th those are just waiting for you to pin them. And once you pin them, they will exist and you can share them with the world. Uh, if you're asking for me to write them, you can certainly hire Ortis and I'll go through the trouble of doing that. But for free, I don't particularly have any desire to spend the time on that right now, so... Do you see he's now commenting that he's talking about the Docker image and he says it has to be built for ARM? Okay. So I, I, I fail to see what the what the problem is that's preventing you from building a Docker image on ARM. Um, the the Ortis Docker images are built on top of Alpine. 
um, which probably wouldn't run on that processor, but you can build whatever Docker image you want. Now, if you're suggesting that you would like Ortis to build additional Docker images that use an ARM version of Java, uh, you can submit that to John Clausen, who's our, our, um, our Docker guy. And we can see if that's worth our time, or you could obviously hire Ortis's consulting services, and you could you could pay for us to create a, a Docker image for you. Right now, the demand for that has been zero, and right. so it's not something we've spent time on. But you're you're free to build a, a custom Docker image all day long. Um, all you need to do is toss command box on it, and you can you can use it. Uh, yeah. The it is also worth noting that the Ortis command box Docker images are out here on GitHub. Um, these are fully open source. Let's see here. I have so many repos, it's hard to find them. No, no. GitHub will, will not search for stuff by default unless I change here. Here we go. Uh, Docker command box. This is the, the source repo that has all of the um, all the files and build scripts for the order stock images. Um, you can take this and you can modify, uh, add your own build, here, here are all the Docker files that we build. Um, you can you can take these, you can rerun them. Uh, you can even submit a pull request if you'd like to add an additional Docker build that we're not currently using. All on GitHub. And of course, it's not necessary to do that if you want to use our off-the-shelf images. Those are all pushed to Docker Hub. You can just do uh, Docker pull to, to get them. Excellent questions, guys. Any more? I don't want to belabor any points if everyone has their questions answered, but I want to give everybody an opportunity. It does look like they're all answered. All that right. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming on. No problem that you went a little long. You always have great stuff to share and so much to pick from. Any closing thoughts or comments you wanted to make? I know you went to that if, screen. Yeah, if you think of a question after the fact that you're like, oh, I wish I'd asked Brad, um, you can ping me on Twitter, BDW429S, um, or even better, uh, join up with the CFML Slack team or the Box team Slack, and I'm in those about 24 seven. Um, there's dedicated channels for Command Box and Docker um, in both of the Slack teams. Uh, you can come in there and you can ask questions. And even if I'm not online, there's probably somebody else who can answer the questions for you. Um, so feel free to reach out if you think of stuff after the fact. Thank you, guys. I just shared his oh. handle there on. Yes, that is my, my Tweety page handle. Awesome. And then uh, for Slack, would it be the same that is also my username on slack yes yeah, cool you betcha all right man well thank you sir we'll let you get mm -hmm. going the rest of your day thanks everybody for coming on thanks for your kind comments and uh i'll get back to the winner of the giveaway of intellij after the session Perfect. i'll talk to y'all later